Hello everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R, Part 19, Base R Plotting. So in the last lesson, we learned about frequency tables and about how you can use them to explore categorical variables. Another thing you can do in your data exploration process is create plots to visually inspect relationships between variables. Now, a lot of other programming languages don't have plotting capabilities built in, but R is nice in that it does have some plotting functions in the base language that you can call at any time without needing to load any sort of libraries. So for this lesson, we're going to load in the diamonds dataset. This is a dataset that is included with the ggplot2 library. So that's why we're loading in ggplot2 only to gain access to this dataset. We're not actually going to use ggplot2 in this lesson. We're gonna load that in so that we can get diamonds. We'll start by showing what a histogram is and how to make one. Um, a histogram is a univariate plot that shows you the distribution of a variable using bins of different widths that you can set yourself. Um, it might be easiest just to create one so that I can explain it. To create a histogram in base R, you just use the hist function and then you pass in whatever variable you want to use for it. Um, this is a plot that you use on numeric variables, so you want to be passing in numerics for this one. And so histogram just shows you the number of observations that fall within different ranges of whatever variable you put on the x-axis. So in this case, the frequency is the counts, and the variable on the x-axis is whatever we passed in, which in this case is caret. So we're seeing there are lots of diamonds in the smaller ranges that are below one caret. That seems to be where most of the density lies, but there are some that are larger, um, and even some that are larger than two carats, which are quite large and expensive as diamonds go. You can take a finer grained look with the histogram by increasing the number of bins. So to do that in base R, you need to add a few extra arguments. You do hist again, the same caret will be the variable, but you can specify the number of bins with this breaks argument. So we're gonna use 50 bins instead of the default that was used in the last one. And we're also going to use xlim to limit the range of the x values between 0 and 3.5 because it looked like from the previous plot there weren't really any carrot or diamonds too much bigger than that. So let's plot that. And we can see that we have a finer grained look at the distribution now. See, there aren't that many diamonds right near 0, but there are a lot that are maybe slightly larger than that. So... So we did limit the plot to carrots 3.5 and below. It could be that there are some diamonds bigger than that that we cut off by specifying that upper bound. So for interest, let's just check a subset of that and see if there were any diamonds larger than that. And so diamonds like these would be considered outliers because they're very far above the typical diamond. Another plot you can use to explore a distribution and in particular view outliers is a box plot. So we'll look into box plots next. What a box plot does is it basically just shows you the median and interquartile range for a variable. I will make it first and then we can go over it. So to do a box plot in base R, you just use the box plot function. Again, you pass in a variable to make the box plot for. We'll do caret again so we can look at it. So the main purpose of a box plot is to show you where the majority of the data lie and to give you a sense of whether there are any outliers as well. So with a box plot, the middle solid bar is where the median is. So the median appears to be maybe a little bit more than half a carat. And the interquartile range, which spans from the 25th to 75th percentile, starts down here at the bottom of the box and ends at the top of the box. So even the middle 50% of diamonds appears to be maybe in the one third to one carat range. And the lines here at the bottom and at the top that are connected with this dotted line, the vast majority of the data lies within the two extremes. But occasionally there are data points that are outliers that lie beyond the extremes. And in this data set, there are quite a few of those just because it's such a large data set. Box plots in base R also allow you to split on a given variable and create multiple box plots for each of the splits. So we'll show how to do that next. Use the box plot function again. You put the dependent 
or response variable first. In this case, we're interested in price and how clarity influences price. So we're putting price first. Then you use this little tilde here. And second, you put the explanatory variable or the variable that you're splitting on second. So we're going to put clarity there, which is essentially the quality level of the internal of the diamond. So I'll run this and see how price varies with clarity or this should provide some insight on that. So we can see we've created these side by side box plots. This side by side box plot actually shows something counterintuitive. The quality of the diamonds is going from lowest on this end to highest on this end. So it appears that diamonds with lower quality are actually have higher prices because these internally flawed diamonds are pretty high. These fairly highly flawed diamonds have pretty high prices. And when, as we're getting to very, very small inclusion diamonds, which are very good diamonds, and even these flawless diamonds here, they have much lower prices than the ones with worse clarity. So that is something that's counterintuitive because if you've ever shopped for diamonds, you would know that ones in this range tend to be much more expensive, all else held equal. So there's clearly some other factor that is influencing this plot. So let's look into that by making another box plot. So in this next box plot, we're going to plot the carat weight versus clarity to see if that could explain anything about that last plot that we looked at. As we can see, when you look at the carat weight versus clarity, there's a pretty clear declining correlation here where larger diamonds tend to have more flaws. And we know that larger diamonds tend to be more expensive. So it kind of makes sense that the diamonds with better clarity are cheaper because those also tend to be smaller. And perhaps the carat weight of the diamond or the size is more important for determining price than the clarity is. So the simple fact that these more flawed diamonds tend to be large means their prices are higher, even if their internal structure isn't as nice as some of these smaller diamonds. We saw histograms earlier as a way to explore the distribution of a numeric variable. A density plot is an alternative method for doing that. It's essentially a continuous version of a histogram in a sense. So instead of having bins, you simply have a curve that approximates what the distribution would be that that variable is drawn from. So to do that, you create first a density object by running the density function on the variable you want to plot. And then you pass the result of that into just the plot function and it will create a density plot. So let's look at the density of caret to get a sense of how this compares to the histogram we saw earlier. And as we can see, it tells us something pretty similar. There's a spike of density at around maybe half to a third caret and around one, and then it trails off heavily as the diamonds get larger. In the last lesson, we saw frequency tables for exploring categorical variables. You can also explore them using plots. In this case, we're going to show how to do it with a bar plot. So to create a bar plot, you can make a table like we saw last time of the variable and then pass that table into the bar plot function. So first, we're going to make a table of the clarity and then we'll pass it to bar plot and create a bar plot of it. So this essentially just creates a visual version of a table. And this can be useful because it helps you get a sense of scale and displaying this sort of thing visually can make it easier to compare different values. And in a presentation, it would make it easier for the audience to take in the numbers instead of having to look at a bunch of raw values in a table. One of the most common types of plots for exploring the relationship between two numeric variables is the scatter plot. What a scatter plot does is it just plots one variable on the x-axis and the other on the y-axis and places a point where every single record lies. So let's try that with the caret and price variables. And since this is a large data set with over 50,000 points, this could get pretty messy, but we'll see what it looks like. It's taking a little while to run because it's having to plot so much ink. The scatter plot gives us a finer grained look at how diamond price is related to caret. 
it almost looks like there's kind of an exponential relationship between carat and price where as the carat increases the price of the diamond starts increasing quicker and quicker now a scatter plot like this with so many points plotted starts to get pretty messy because there's so much ink that's overlapping it's hard to get a sense of how many points there actually are here so one thing you can do to try to reduce that is introducing some transparency to the points that are plotted. So we're going to use the plot function again to recreate the plot, but we're going to introduce an additional argument call, which stands for color. We're not actually going to introduce any color, so we're going to set the RGB values of red, green, and blue all to zero. All we want is to introduce some transparency. So this final argument alpha is the value that does that. And as we can see, the points that were only single values out here in the tail are pretty hard to see now because they're only at 10% of their normal opacity. But in this region where diamonds are very common, it's still very dark because there's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of data points overlapping here. So even at 10% opacity, there's still a lot of data collected there. For plotting data related to dates, it's common to use line plots with the date on the x-axis and some other numeric variable you might be interested in on the y-axis. So we'll look at how to make a line plot in base R. First, we're just going to generate some fake year data so that we can plot it and some readings to plot on the y-axis. To make a line plot, you just use the plot function again, just like we did for the scatter plot, except you set this extra argument type equal to the string L. And when we run that, it will create a line plot instead of a scatter plot. So let's see the result there. The main strength of R's base plotting functions is just creating fairly simple plots of this sort in a quick and dirty fashion without having to write a whole lot of code. But there are some additional plot parameters you can add to spruce things up a little bit. So before the end of the lesson, we'll just go into a few different parameters that you can use to make your plots nicer in base R if you want to do that. To illustrate some of the different parameters and things you can do in base R plotting, we're going to make a new bar plot. It's actually going to be a side-by-side -side bar plot this time of diamond color versus diamond clarity. So this will give us a sense of the distribution of different diamond colors within each clarity. So to do that, we're passing in a table of color by clarity to the bar plot function. We're going to create a legend of the different colors. We're going to pass in this extra argument beside equals true. That creates a side by side bar plot instead of a stacked one. And then we're going to set some axes labels and a title. So you use the xlab argument here to set the x-axis label, the y-lab for the y-axis label, main you use to set the title of the entire plot, so we're giving the plot a name, and this call argument here you can pass in custom colors. So in this case we're passing in a list of hex codes for different colors that kind of match the hue of actual diamond colors. So let's just run this and see what the plot looks like. You can see that even in base R, you can make some pretty nice looking plots with some color and axis labels, and even a legend. Now the way base R plotting constructs plots is it essentially draws ink onto a canvas that can be constructed in layers. So after creating an initial plot, you can actually add more to it with additional function calls. So we'll just show how you can go about constructing a plot in layers by remaking the line plot we made earlier, but adding some additional parameters and some additional plot elements to that plot. So here we're going to recreate the line plot from earlier, but we're just going to spruce it up with some extra parameters and draw some extra things onto the canvas. So again, we're just recreating the plot with the years and readings. Type L means line plot. This time we're going to pass in cull equals red. That'll change the line color to red. We're going to increase the line width by passing this LWE equals two. And we're also going to give it a title. And after creating this initial plot, which this call will do, we're going to add some extra things afterwards, essentially layering more things on top of the existing plot. So here, this points call 
draws points at the vertices of the line plot because our initial plot only had the line. Sometimes it's nice to have points, but it's easier to see specific values. So we're just going to draw points for the same data. And this PHC argument just sends what point symbol you want. In this case, we're passing in something different than the default, which would probably just be a dot. So this will have a different type of point. The ab line function will draw arbitrary lines on plots wherever you want them, given arguments for the y-intercept and slope. So this particular line is just going to be drawn at the average value for the plot. So a, which is the y-intercept, we're just going to set to the average. And b, which is the slope, we're going to set to zero because we want a horizontal line at where the average is. You can also draw text onto an existing plot. So to do that, you call the text function. We're going to use text, and then you just need to pass in the X and Y coordinates where you want the text to appear. This particular text is basically just going to be a label for this average line that we're drawing on. So we want it to appear just above that line. So we'll have it set to X 2010, which should be at the right side of the plot, because this plot is in terms of years. And Y, we're going to set to the average plus 2, because we don't want the text right on top of the line, and the line is at the average already. So we'll say plus 2 to just put it right above the line. And the labels is just what the text says. So we'll label this mean reading, because that's what the line means. Finally, we'll draw one more line set to the kind of trend line of the data. So to do that, we'll draw another ab line. But, and instead of passing in an explicit slope and y-intercept, you can instead create a line based on a linear model of the data, essentially a regression model. And to do that, you use the LM function, which means linear model. To use the linear model function, you just pass in the dependent variable or the variable on the y-axis first, so that's readings. And then you use this little tilde, and then you pass in the variable on the x-axis or the explanatory variable essentially what you're using to predict the first one after the tilde so when we pass this in it will create uh, essentially the line we want that will be the trend line for the data and then we just need to pass in any other parameters we want to spruce up that line in this case we're going to color the line blue we're going to give it a different line type of dashed a dashed line dotted line and we'll set the line width to two so let's run this, and we should see our same line plot, but with a bunch of new elements added to it. So as you can see, the underlying data of the line plot is the same in this red line, but we've added a few more things to it. It has a title, and it's red with some dots at the points. We have a line for the average reading, and we also have this blue dotted line indicating the trend line. Being able to construct plots in this layered fashion is kind of nice, especially for base R plotting, which is often used just for quick and dirty exploratory analysis, because maybe during exploratory analysis, you create a very simple plot like that line plot, and you decide, hmm, that's something I could look more into or add more to. You wouldn't have to remake the initial line plot. You could just draw other things onto that canvas with other function calls. The de facto standard for doing more complicated plotting in R is called ggplot2, which is a package that is able to make nicer graphics that you could even include on a web page or in a publication. So in the next lesson, we'll go into the basics of plotting with ggplot2. See you next time.